Well, okay, boys and girls, here we are again with another teeny tiny technical tutorial from No SLLC. That's me. Uh, if you just came over from part three, this should uh, flow nicely, I hope. Um, because I'm actually on page 20 of the 32 that I uh, put together for this entire uh, tutorial or extension of time division multiplexing uh, from that very first video I put up some time ago. So, here we go. <coughs> What are we going to look at in this fourth part? Well, expand on, guess what, parts one, two, and three to include this. Channelized and unchannelized line formats, some payload synchronization issues, and a little tiny bit about higher order multiplexing than our uh, T type or E type that we've looked at so far. Okay, first channelized and unchannelized line format. This has caused lots of confusion. Um, when I was um, doing the telco side of stuff for a large metropolitan newspaper, no, it wasn't that. It was um, the developer of CDMA systems. I was one of the few people there that had a telephone company background, many years in the phone company, uh, working on T-type carrier systems um, because I began working on those about 1965. So I was quite familiar with this uh, issue uh, and had to explain it very, very often uh, to uh, the folks that were handling what's called the backhaul. The backhaul runs from the base uh, station controller or the switching center, whatever you're used to calling uh, cellular system uh, switch locations, out to the uh, radio transmitter locations or the cell sites. So we used uh, an unchannelized backhaul uh, on that side of the base station uh, controller, but on the uh, uh, public switch telephone side, the PSTN network side, we used channelized uh, T-type and E-type carrier. And trying to explain the difference um, between the two often um, took a long time. So we don't have that much time. I'm going to walk through it much faster. So here we go. Um, I've got a, a multiplexer, a T-type or an E-type. In this case, um, I'm showing you both down here. Here's a T-type frame right here. And here's an E-type frame down here. <coughs> okay. When I have a channelized, which is what we've been looking at so far, each physical uh, channel 64K 8-bit uh, byte output is mapped to a specific 8-bit time slot. So I've got an 8-bit byte coming out of a, a buffer, a channel buffer over here. And there'll be, in the T-type, there'll be 24 of these. In the E-type, right, there'll be, what, 32 starting from zero over here. So um, they'll each be putting out an 8-bit byte 8,000 times per second, right? Boom, 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 like that. Each one of those will be time division multiplexed out here onto the transmission stream. And you can see, if you can catch these, if they're not jerking around too bad, I've got eight bits, eight buckets for this guy, the red guy. And I've got eight bits for the purple guy right here. And I've got eight bits right here. Each one of those is a time slot, or if you prefer, a channel. Although you've got to be really careful about saying time slot channel or interchangeable. They're not. Some systems don't match time slot to channel number. But I digress. Um, so over here now, I'm showing you one other thing. I got a bogus box up here. Because if I were feeding in digital data, not voice, and if I had a codec here, I'd have a 64 kilobit output from the codec. But if I were sending in digital data, let's say at you know, 2.4 kilobits, this is a 64 kilobit stream right here. Yeah, 8 bits, 8,000 times per second. If I only had 2.4 kilobits of data coming in, digital data, I would have to stuff a whole bunch of extra things in here. That's what DDS always did. It's called bit stuffing and byte stuffing. Uh, more than I want to go into here. Anyway, that's why I have this little box up here, bogus stuffer box, in order to um, add enough bits in here to have a 64 kilobit 8-bit byte output that fits within the time slot or the channel, right? 
and it's always the same always the same so this is always the same right always the same always the same doesn't vary so I know where everything is kinda <laughs> The reason I say kinda is because remember the 50 parts per million plus or minus. So even though we say, yeah, it's 1.544 megabits per second out here on the line, consisting of 24 time slots of 8 bits each, but in fact the rate itself can vary a little bit. Although each one will in fact be 8 bits, it's just maybe they're a teeny tiny shorter in duration on some systems than on other systems. The bit counts correct in terms of the channels but the bit rate can vary right so that's all that's saying is how wide the bits are in time it can vary a little bit so that's channelized we've looked at this many times before everything I've shown you so far is channelized it's easy to understand if you've been following uh, all the other tutorials it's when I move over to this other one that it gets confusing for so many people because in unchannelized, what I have is a bit stream. Remember the buckets going back and forth, full duplex on that previous uh, tutorial? The buckets going around and around and around like that? Well, this time you just have to think of it as a long string of buckets with no particular organization as far as the multiplexer of the transmitter and the receiver are concerned. It's just a stream of buckets coming in with something in them or not right full bucket mark empty bucket space so in this case I'm showing you three different bit rate streams coming into the multiplexer in this one I've got a 4-bit package an 8-bit package and a 12-bit package now in actuality this would be probably several thousand bits long maybe this was 5,000 bits long and this one's 10,000 bits long it doesn't really matter for our uh, overview. <clears throat> so I'm showing you four bits coming in here. The multiplexer is going to assign four bits to that input, four. The next one, it says I need to have eight bits sent out on the shared facility. So in time, it's going to put eight bits right behind the four, right? right there and then finally I've got a 12-bit chunk comes in here and the muck says okay well I'm gonna stick you on the end of the train 12 12 12 12 like that so these are not channelized into 8 bits 8 bits 8 bits 8 bits 8 bits and I could find those just by looking at the time position well these are not in fixed time positions that is this grouping is not in a fixed time position the bits are in fixed time position right there's 1.544 plus or minus of these per second as far as the buckets are concerned but as far as the information in the buckets it's not set to any particular position within the string of buckets okay so you have to think of this now as the frame that's going out because we still have to have framing so that the receiver can uh, line up with the transmitter. So we still need this framing bit right here to establish the frame's beginning, that is the payload's beginning, right? <clears throat> because I have 193 bits now that are open for anything. I still have 8,000 frames per second, so my payload now becomes 1.536 megabits for payload and the multiplexer can lay the stuff in any way it wants to. Down here on the E-type carrier I have 256 right in the frame minus the 8 for this guy right here right because that's the overhead remember the framing structure has to be put here so the receiver knows where to start counting the payload bits that's what the framing structure byte in E-carrier does is what the framing bit in T carrier does. So now I have a 1.984 megabit payload that I can lay the data in. This is digital data. I can lay it in here any way I want. That's not channelized. So each physical tributary is input 
mapped into or even across multiple frames because the most I could get in this one frame is <coughs> excuse me is um, is uh, 248 bits in the frame right so if this were more than 248 bits it would have to be mapped across two frames or even three frames okay now I know this is a, a bit of a handful because you don't at least I haven't told you about this structure back here other than that it is either a 4 bits or 8 bits or 12 bits but in fact these, this bit stream coming in here could be some kind of HDLC type frame high level data link control type frame which could be multiple multiple bits long and so when I start throwing these things in here this structure down here has to have its own organization so that it's receiver way, way out at the other end can make sense of what's coming to it because this has no idea it's just a transport mechanism oh no there's somebody else calling me I don't want to talk to them either okay I know this is confusing when you first start up but um, and believe me I, t I told you trying to explain to the folks uh, on the backhaul side uh, how T and E can be not channelized uh, gets to be a handful because in fact in our systems this uh, device right here that actually transmitted the uh, physical signal out was uh, called a CSU DSU and you could program it for differing amounts of uh, capacity so you could do what's often called fractionalized T or fractionalized E where you actually restricted the throughput on this down from 1.536 uh, payload to maybe half of that. Uh, that's a bit too much. I don't want to go off on that tangent right now. Okay, so that brings us finally to this. I just mentioned it. How to synchronize data structures coming from like local area networks into our T or E type transmission system. Now I've given you a very very simple local area network data frame here. I haven't even put any detail in here. But let's say it's 100 bits in this data frame. Right? Local area network data frame. And um, <clears throat> that 100 bits takes one second to transmit. Right? So I've got 100 bits per second because the frame duration is one second and I have 100 bits in here. Though the duration of each bit then is one one hundredth of a second right here. Let's say they look like this. Each one of these bit positions is one one hundredth of a second in duration. So they'll go into this, I'll call it a collector right here. It's a buffer, elastic store. So they come in here, boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, like that. Kind of slow. What happens is they get squished. Does that sound familiar? This is a high tech version, huh? They get squished down in time. So they look like this. <laughs> so over here it was bump, ba bump, ba bump. But over here it's <laughs> really, really fast. Is that the right word? No. No. <laughs> it just squashed them down in time. Unfortunately, uh, English has some problems here because we use terms to mean something different sometimes with the same word. Anyway, so I take this down and I compress, take this in here and compress it down in time. Now I couldn't compress these things until I actually got them all, right? So there's actually a storage going on in here, a collector. It has to collect them, boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, before it can put out a fixed number of these things over here because it has to collect the fixed number over here. So what I've done then is this. I've taken this 100 bits per second right here, a one second frame, and I've compressed this stuff down, this 100 bits, so that it fits inside a T-type carrier frame in this example right here. Here's my start marker position. Here is my entire frame, right? Remember the payload of this frame is 192 bits. It's 193 bits counting this one but the payload is 192 bits, I want to use 100 bits of that 192 to transport this information. So the payload bits used in the frame are 100. These are the 100 payload bits, that is the LAN data frame. 
Now over here, the duration of this entire frame right here, remember Nyquist, duration is 125 microseconds. Therefore, each bit that's in here, 100 of which are these squashed down in time. So the duration of each bit over here is 1 125th microseconds. Over here it was 1 100th second. The same bits now occupy right, 1 125th microseconds. Now this is the really important piece to, to get out of all this is that the Gazinta and the Gazauta are the same, right? The Gazauta is the same pattern as the thing that went in. So I Gazin over here and I Gazout over here, but it's the same pattern. So I haven't changed the information that's being coded in this frame over here, this frame over here. This information is exactly the same as over here. I've just rate adapted it. Now, once again, this is really important when you're first learning this. I did not increase the speed of this. You okay with that? This is 100 bits per second. Over here, it's still 100 bits per second from the perspective of the endpoints. That is, the transmitter and the receiver. Sent, this guy sent it at 100 bits per second. The guy over here is going to receive it at 100 bits per second. But in the transport mechanism, those 100 bits are actually going to occupy almost no time at all. Right? This is really important because everybody keeps talking about increasing the speed of the data. You don't increase the speed. It's still moving at the same bit rate for its own self. The transmission facility itself over here, the T carrier or E carrier back and forth, it's got a hot, very high bit rate, but it's only carrying a little teeny chunk of its total capacity. And that little teeny chunk, in this case, is our 100 bits. This is confusing for a lot of people. You're probably going to have to deal with this a couple of times to get this understood, because everybody in the, in the entire industry keeps talking about high speed data. And I'm going to make it go faster. No, you don't. You just decrease its duration. Oh, good grief. There's yet my other phone. I have two phones. How lucky. I'm not going to answer that one either. Hard case. So here's a different way to look at it. Rate adaption uh, example number two. I've got 56 kilobits input rate to a system, right? So I've got a bunch of bits coming into this buffer at 56 kilobits. But I have to convert that rate up to 1.544. Hmm, that's very loud. 1.544, because that's the rate, not the speed for the T-type carrier transmission. So I'm going to come in here slow, save up enough so that I can dump them out at this higher rate, not speed. And I'm going to lay them into this frame, T-type carrier frame in this example. Right? So I've got 192 bits within the frame that I can dump these, these bits right here. I can dump them in there, but I have to dump them in there at the right rate so that they'll fall in the buckets at the right time. They'll fall in every bucket, of course, except the yellow bucket. Right? So this is a frame rotation like that. So the transmitter sends that to the other end, and then that outputs them at this higher rate, the 1.544 megabit rate. But then it goes back into a stretcher, if you will, because this was a compressor, a buffer, save up thing. This was like an expander, a time expander. So they come in here like that, but then they get sent out. Right? So doop doop doop. Over here it's going doop doop doop. Right? Oop. Well, well, uh, well, no extra charge for the sound effects, folks. Then the uh, the other inputs, because you can have multiple inputs here, of course. You, have, you don't want as, as many as you can possibly handle. So they're going to have to wait until this buffer is cleared, right, before they can go, you know, really fast. Yeah. Does that help any better than the first example? Uh, I don't know. 
I guess you'll tell me. Send me an email. That was really stupid. Especially the sound effects. Okay. How about this? Maybe this will help. This is a really important concept. That's why I'm giving you three different ways to think about it. So over here, I've got this little dude. He's sending really fast. 56,000 bits per second. That's his right there. Right? Goes into the multiplex. But out here, right, the streams, the buckets are running at 1.54 million bits per second. So his little wimpy boop, 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 like that is occupying just a teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny little bit of that 1.544 million bits. Over here, she's seeing those bits coming out at 56,000 bits per second because he's sending them at 56. She's receiving them at 56. But over here, they're running at this higher rate. Are they physically moving any faster here than they were over here? No, they're not. The electrical pulses are going down the wire at you know, several thousand miles an hour. Out here, the electrical pulses are moving at several thousand miles an hour. And over here, they're moving at several thousand miles an hour. So I didn't increase the speed here. I increased the rate for the whole thing. But if I were to just count these guys right here, if I'm standing right here, I'd say they came by at 56K because I don't pay any attention to these guys here. So even though the transmission system was running at 1.544, my individual sub-channel is still 56. <coughs> okay? This is important. And the reason it's important to understand this is that, consider this. Fiber transmissions, they run into terabits. Now, if this is 1.544 million bits in one second, passing his little beard right there, and I move this up to terabits, right, terabits, would that change my end to end for these people? Nope. It would still be 56 from here to here. It would still be 56 for that single little piece of information that I'm sending, but the totality of the transmission would be terabits. That's pretty, pretty high a bit rate. Would those buckets be this wide? No. They would be so skinny, there would just be a little black line. They would be so short in time that I couldn't even draw them. All right. So all I'm doing is changing the time dimension of the bits out here so I get more in the system level, but I don't get any more at the channel level. Ooh. Have I beat you to death on that one? <coughs> I hope not. This is really important. I, I've, just, I've gone over this so many times over the years, and the new people coming in keep confusing speed and rate. It's really important you understand the rate. The rate can be increased or decreased, but the speed does not. Because once you move into fiber, you can't make it go any faster than the speed of light. Let's look at a higher order multiplexing process. Now, the way we've always done it in the past is to do this, asynchronous digital hi hierarchy. We've got some weird words here, plesiochronous. I've got a T-type or E-type carrier system. In this case, I'm showing you T-type that's uh, coming in here. <coughs> and I want to combine um, several of them, right? I want to combine them in a, a mux of muxes over here. The problem is the, the uh, transmitter way over here is sending signal to this receiver uh, within this spec of T-type carrier, 1.544, right, plus or minus 50 parts per million. So in my example, I'm showing you this one is coming in at 1545. Now, is that a problem for this receiver based on this transmitter? No, they line up to each other. They synchronize to each other. So there's synchronous here, right? But when I look at this guy right here and compare it with this guy right here, this transmitter talking to this receiver, which is also synchronous to itself, they're synchronized, this rate is 1544. This rate was 1545. And then uh, down here on the third one, the transmitter receiver are synchronous to themselves, but 
this guy is actually running at 1543. So I've got three different bit rates right here. They're plesiochronous. They're almost there, but they're not exactly the same. All right. So what happens then is when I bring this one in and this one in and this one in to multiplex these multiplexed uh, bit streams, I have a problem. My output is going to be asynchronous, meaning that I, I don't know exactly where the, let's say, channel 1 up here was or time slot 1. It's going to get mapped over here. Well, I'm not sure exactly where that's going to be because sometimes this guy has to stuff extra bits in here to make up for the slow guys, right? right? Because they're not multiples of one another, I may have to stuff it once and then not the next time and stuff it and not and stuff it and not. Right? So I've given you a little, my little electromites talking to you down here. Receivers 1 through 28, because I can have 28 in my example right here to give me what's called a, a DS3. So I have 28 receivers. They're synchronous to their transmitters out here, out here, but they're not clocked from a common source. Right? So the Megamux, I just made that up, the Megamux transmitter must strip off the DS1 framing that was coming in off of this. It has to strip off the DS1 framing and put its own framing on. So I'm stripping off here, here, and here that start marker bit, remember that? <coughs> so it has to add its own overhead and it has to stuff bogus bits as required to come up to the 44.736 megabits going on out here to the next mega DMUX over here, which will split these things back out, point, 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 out to the individual DS1 uh, rates right here. Now, I've got a little thing down here that says make drop and ins it makes drop and insert difficult. What that's telling you is that <coughs> in here I can establish synchronization and determine where time slot 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is. I could pull that out very easily and stuff something else back in there. Right? So I could drop a channel out and insert new information into that channel time slot. It's called drop and insert. But if I try to do it over here, because this thing is, uh, is stuffing and not stuffing and stuffing and not stuffing in order to keep this bit rate uh, correct out here, I never really know where any of those individual DS zeros are. So in order to find one, I have effectively have to demultiplex this whole thing, the whole thing back down to the point where I can get to an individual channel down here. So it was very cumbersome to do it to do it this way, drop and insert. And uh, believe me, the, there's a lot of reason why you want to do drop and insert. So it was difficult. So a later um, version of this whole thing came up, um, and it's called uh, synchronous digital hierarchy (SDH). And uh, once again, I've massively simplified all this stuff. <coughs> so what I've got now is a standardization with um, standard clocks every place, very, very highly high accuracy clocks, all driving these uh, subsystems. So I've got an STM1, Synchronous Transport Module, that's what it's called, right? That's running at 155.52, not 154. Remember, that was T. This is a new standard, 155.52. And every one of these tributaries coming in are running at this 155.52, STM1. I can take four of those into this Megamux right here, right? Four of those make the STM4 with an output running at 622.08 very very tightly timed very accurate so I could find in here at this STM4 I could easily find a single channel that was coming in from back over here real easy I can take four of these little dudes right here which consists of four right? each one has four inputs I just showed one so I can take four of these things and put them over here to make a 16 right four Right, 4 times 4, 16. 
notice how I'm running this this a little bit slower I don't mean to show you that this rotation is less than guess what 125 microseconds every one of these things is running at 125 microseconds even out here even though it looks like it's going faster all I'm really trying to show you is that this this is a multiple of that and this is a multiple of that and this is a multiple of that not that this is rotating faster or slower than the original 125 microseconds once again this it's really amazing because the bit here for channel 1 over here is the same bit it's just now a teeny tiny little fraction of a microsecond whereas maybe over here it was a microsecond right so the bit intervals get shorter but the rotation time has to remain 125 microseconds because guess what everything is based on Nyquist for 4 kilohertz voice channels okay so this is very accurate here um, this is just one SDH there are other um, higher level synchronicities synchronous hierarchies like OC levels but you know, that's a story for another day and I think I'm done so I hope this gives you at least a high level understanding of how you can multiplex these time uh, positions um, either asynchronously or synchronously synchronously obviously is much better but it requires extremely accurate clocks and common clocking to all of these things from one clocking source very accurate source and I think my clock has run out so we be done we did it for today I'll see you on another tutorial perhaps have a nice day